Um, I'm really pleased to be welcoming you to the seventh of eight Going Global webinars in the series this year. Um, it's been a fantastic series so far and we've got um, two brilliant ones still to come. So this afternoon's one is focusing on um, behaviour change uh, with quality improvement, but it's really conversation, hopefully as an opportunity for you to share your experiences, your thoughts, your questions, what's gone wrong, hopefully what's gone right as well, but also any insights into the programmes um, of work that you've been involved in both at the NHS and overseas as well. I'm really pleased to be joined uh, by my colleagues Alice and Bernard, um, who are global health experts on a number of things, but not least uh, behaviour change, quality improvement and global engagement um, more broadly. So I'm really pleased to hand over to Alice. Thanks, Alice. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I think to say that I'm the expert in behaviour change is incorrect. That's that's where Bernard comes in. But everybody, I um, currently do work with that a little bit, but I've also come up through a background of being a healthcare professional. I'm a physiotherapist for being a for over 25 years now. Um, and have over my career spent a fair bit of time overseas and particularly in the last 10 years, uh, 12 years with a health partnership um, sort of delivering trauma services, trauma care, orthopaedic surgery um, in, in Kenya. So I think um, coming to this as a sort of partly to have a conversation um, with Bernard, because um, I know this series is for those of you who've got lots of you got much of masses of experience and we'd love you to, to share your, your sort of thoughts, frustrations, successes as, as part of this afternoon. Um, and for those of you that, that haven't been overseas before, it's just a, maybe an essence of, of talking through some stories, some little sort of case studies um, that might just help you sort of think about um, where you you actually you know, might have some great successes, but also might just come up a few things that challenge you a little bit in the sense of that questioning, maybe how effective you're being with affecting, um, affecting behaviour change. So I was just going to set the scene a little bit with a couple of... Um, I, uh, um, issues I'd, I've come across and then um, pass over um, to my colleague Bernard who, um, Bernard do you want to just very briefly introduce yourself now and, uh, and your, your background? Uh, hello, uh, thanks everyone, uh, it's really my pleasure to speak to you, my name is uh, Bernard, I am a PhD student at Banga University and I am also involved in international health working where I'm supporting one of the health partnerships to deliver their interventions in Kenya. I originally come from Kenya myself and have worked with uh, different teams of healthcare workers. So uh, I'm just going to share a bit of experience about that during the session and uh, hoping to interact uh, more with you during the session. Thank you very much. Over to you, Alice. Yeah, thanks, Bernard. So I think when I first went overseas, I was thinking about it again last night before today, was actually when I'd been only qualified for a couple of years, and it was as a physiotherapist to go and work with the community-based rehabilitation workers in Nepal for six months. And I was very much working with them and I think helping increase their rep repertoire of, of exercises and ideas they had to work with the disabled children that um, they were working with. And it was a wonderful experience of my sort of first time overseas. And I'm just sort of trying to reflect on was I actually trying to affect behaviour? And maybe a little bit, but I think it was that was much more just through sort of technical support of giving new ideas and demonstrating um, sort of new exercises and a, and a bit of education. And, and it, I was pretty naive, but I think I had a, hopefully was, was beneficial and, and, and had a great time, but I maybe wasn't looking at instigating such systems change um, or sort of a quality improvement project in, in how something more complex um, or technical happens at a, a, a sort of maybe more service level. Um, but more recently, I've spent the last, as I said, 10 years um, or so with a health partnership in Kenya. And um, I, there's nothing against any of the individuals, but so we've um, often been doing sort of orthopedic surgery and we run clinics for those that, that need, for the unmet um, need of trauma. And as you can imagine, probably when a um, traveling orthopedic team rock up, there's a lot of trauma that we need to treat, but also a huge number of the sort of unmet burden of musculoskeletal um, disease and disability, particularly in the form of back pain and other osteoarthritic um, conditions. So I had this situation where I we had lots of patients and often doing things on a one-to-one -one 
um, is not particularly time efficient. And a huge amount of the evidence suggests that classes could be really helpful. So I got all enthusiastic and ran a back pain class and uh, had the local physios there observing me. And I wrote everything down and I gave all the evidence and thought this had gone really well and came away and went back the following year and was pretty devastated that it well not devastated but it hadn't really been repeated and again repetitively every time we go we run sort of back school classes we take the evidence base with us but it it's often it's maybe a change that doesn't quite ever sort of feel as if it's sustainable or continue when on when we're not there and I, it's nothing against the individuals that we work with but I think it was just using that as a little case of maybe an example of where I individually might feel you go and deliver an intervention which you believe is to be helpful and you believe is to be following evidence but there's something where it maybe gets a little bit stuck and this is where um, I've asked Bernard to try and help us unpick it to maybe un unpick those essences of the theories of behaviour change um, that I you know wasn't considering at, at that point in point in time. So Bernard I think you've got a few slides for us to take us through it. Uh, yes, Alice, uh, thank you very much for the wonderful uh, introduction. So I'll just uh, bear with me two seconds. I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen. Uh, and again, uh, Alice, uh, I must say thank you for, uh, for setting uh, the stage uh, for us. Uh, for today's discussions. You have uh, shared really uh, wonderful insights uh, about your experiences uh, that will uh, help us to explore the concept of behavior change and uh, what strategies could be applied to realize uh, more impact both in the short and long term uh, through international health working. So as I have mentioned, I previously worked in um, uh, Kenya uh, before moving to the UK about three years ago. And uh, just like Alice, uh, we're trying to influence the um, uh, behaviors and practices of healthcare professionals uh, around infection prevention and antimicrobial stewardship. And my experience uh, resonates well with that of Alice as well. And I do recall uh, some of our main activities included uh, training uh, a core group of healthcare workers who we commonly refer to as uh, champions because they are going to champion the change agenda within those healthcare settings. And then we could support uh, this uh, core group of healthcare workers to develop uh, plans that then they would try to effect the desired change in their work settings. And uh, then uh, subsequently would conduct uh, some follow-up activities to see how they were uh, kind of uh, uh, faring on with uh, the, uh, the, the, the change interventions within their settings. And uh, so uh, just to uh, um, uh, highlight uh, a few of the issues that uh, uh, began to emerge as we started to roll out our interventions. So uh, there was uh, initially, we realized uh, that there was some kind of enthusiasm when we came up with these interventions and tried to um, uh, roll them uh, to the healthcare workers. But with time, there are issues that uh, began to uh, crop up uh, so there are concerns around uh, some barriers being uh, uh, or preventing the healthcare workers from effecting the changes that uh, we wanted them to implement within their work settings. And there were a lot of issues just to discuss a few of them. One of them was the issue of staff shortages. And uh, sometimes the staff that we trained would tell us, okay, you know, this idea is really good, but at the moment we saw pressed of uh, 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 staff, it's not possible for me to try and engage the other healthcare workers on this. And so we have to prioritize uh, meeting the immediate needs of the patients who are presenting to us. There are issues, uh, systemic issues, uh, they are not being uh, uh, that kind of uh, governance uh, structures required to infect some of the changes. 
lack of policies. Sometimes some of the healthcare workers will tell us uh, that their managers are not uh, really supporting what they are trying to do, or they are not even aware of uh, what exactly they are trying to, to implement. So they lacked uh, on that kind of managerial support just to try and uh, 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 enable them to uh, 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 effect those changes within their work settings. And then uh, there was another issue uh, that we uh, experienced, and this was around the rotation of healthcare workers. Now, the way the health system is organized back in Kenya, uh, you've got uh, the healthcare workers uh, might be working in one department for a certain period of time, then they are moved to another totally different department. So let's say, for instance, you've trained uh, some of the, the nurses on, um, uh, on a skill, for instance, uh, a delivery skill such as the kangaroo mother care, and then they, move, they are moved to orthopedic uh, uh, department and they are there for three years. So if you are relying on these uh, trained um, uh, staff to help you effect the change, then you won't have them in the right place. Uh, so, and that kind of disrupted our uh, uh, change agenda and uh, slowed us down. So there are also, also issues such as financial resources that uh, 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 you'd find that some, some of the changes required that they, uh, they, there are some uh, 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 supplies that they needed uh, for, uh, in place within their work setting. And these were not being provided by the, their employers. And uh, this would kind of um, uh, uh, impact on their ability to try and effect uh, that change. Uh, and uh, if I can also uh, discuss the issue of professional roles, uh, for instance, you're trying to effect infection prevention practices within a healthcare setting. And let's say you train uh, uh, one group of healthcare workers, then the other one starts feeling that they are either left out and these, uh, these constant uh, conflicts between uh, professionals as they're just doing for their space within the healthcare system. And uh, so it took a lot of mediation and uh, just trying to uh, make them understand that the most important thing is to try and uh, have those uh, uh, practices in place. And in some instances where we um, managed to um, uh, uh, well, like address uh, some of these barriers, we, we could see some successes, but in, in a lot of instances, again, they were, uh, uh, it was uh, quite difficult to try and uh, uh, change the uh, behaviors and practices of, uh, of healthcare workers. Uh, and we also, with time, we began to appreciate the need to look at uh, healthcare practices of healthcare workers from a more broader uh, systemic uh, uh, point of view, where we, uh, we consider this healthcare worker or this professional to be in uh, just one element within a broader uh, system. And if we wanted to uh, 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 effect uh, changes or if we wanted to influence their practices, then we had to to kind of engage with the broader systems uh, with, within which uh, this healthcare worker was placed. And um, uh, there were some successes uh, and there were also some frustrations uh, in the process. So, and uh, at that time, we, uh, I personally did not have uh, uh, much understanding of um, possibly what factors might uh, be influencing um, uh, people's behaviors. And uh, but, uh, uh, afterwards, uh, after um, a lot of uh, research and also by virtue of my current uh, uh, PhD studies, which is uh, around behavior change. So there's that kind of um, improved understanding and uh, there's, um, I've come across uh, lots of evidence around behavior change and uh, how we can go about um, implementing um, uh, behavior change interventions. And Alice's experience, as well as my experience um, with um, effecting change within um, uh, 
or health partnerships. We see uh, this kind of um, approaches across uh, many interventions as they tend to rely more on uh, uh, clinical evidence of need for an intervention, uh, as opposed to looking at the broader behavior change ecosystem that would improve uh, chances of uh, success in um, influencing behaviors of healthcare professionals. So uh, such an approach does not uh, guarantee success. We need to focus more on uh, the underpinning mechanisms uh, that influence people's uh, behaviors uh, in order to make our interventions more successful. And to change uh, be uh, people's behaviors, we need to apply behavior change principles that target the relevant determinants uh, of uh, behavior change. And therefore, uh, before we can do that, uh, this means that we need to have some bit of understanding uh, uh, about uh, 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 behavior change and what really it entails. So the factors that influence behavior, behavior and behavior change in uh, people uh, include uh, a wide range of factors. It could, it could range from uh, knowledge, their skills. Uh, do they have the, uh, the, the skills to engage in that behavior? Do they know how to engage in that behavior? There are aspects of social influences uh, that could influence people's behaviors. Sometimes uh, you find that um, if uh, people within uh, their social networks of those healthcare professionals or those people that we are trying to change their behavior are engaging or not engaging in certain behaviors. It's, it's got an impact on the uh, practices and behaviors of uh, uh, people within uh, that system. Uh, there are aspects of professional, uh, uh, professional roles and identity, which I have uh, briefly touched on. Uh, sometimes if we do not uh, uh, have a clear understanding of the professional relationships and roles within our healthcare systems, uh, uh, it kind of uh, can create that kind of um, uh, a conflict between uh, the professionals. And uh, uh, there are those uh, professionals who will also uh, not engage in a certain behavior because they have not been involved in the design or the uh, planning or design of that uh, intervention. So uh, these are factors that we really need to be uh, conscious about. The aspects of uh, intentions, uh, that uh, behavioral intentions, uh, the goals of, of, uh, of the behavior. Uh, we also have uh, the uh, effect or the impact of emotions, environmental context, if it is um, designed in a way that will encourage the healthcare workers to uh, engage in uh, uh, the desired behaviors or, or not, and also the element of reinforcement. Uh, when uh, Healthcare workers engage in certain practices or behaviors, and then uh, they are reinforced to, through uh, 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 avenues such as providing of uh, constructive feedback on their behaviors that can kind of reinforce their behaviors. Uh, sometimes uh, we've used uh, awards and um, uh, uh, recognition to try and uh, uh, reinforce those behaviors because this, uh, uh, when they, 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 they see that their efforts are being recognized, uh, then they are able to um, uh, carry on engaging in the same efforts. Uh, I'll give an example of where we um, uh, were using uh, an award system and uh, uh, on infection prevention practices. So initially it was uh, quite uh, difficult to roll this program out, but with time, with uh, some bit of funding, we're able to come up with uh, a recognition program. And uh, during the annual scientific conferences of healthcare workers, we could recognize and uh, give awards to those institutions that were performing 
uh, really well in terms of their infection uh, prevention and control practices. And we saw some enthusiasm around infection pre uh, prevention and control within uh, some uh, settings where they would not um, uh, really uh, engage or they were not uh, sub, uh, they were not really buying into the uh, uh, practices that we are trying to promote. And now because there was that element of award and recognition and every hospital kind of wanted to uh, have attained that bar of um, uh, excellence. So there, there was kind of enthusiasm, managerial support, and uh, that broader, we saw like that broader uh, system, systems being put in place so that they can support uh, infection prevention uh, practices in, in those settings. So there is, uh, considering uh, the factors of uh, 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 behavior change and uh, behavior, it's important to uh, understand that there is no size that uh, fits all uh, while we're trying to look at the issues of uh, behavior change in our health uh, partnerships or when we engage with uh, uh, health professionals through our health partnerships. Uh, we need to consider the factors that might be relevant for the people we are working with during the design and implementation of our interventions and what has uh, effectively worked elsewhere might not have the same impact on another group uh, of people or uh, of healthier workers and uh, bearing this in mind therefore it's always um, uh, worth having uh, preliminary engagements with the people we intend to uh, work with and this may include uh, undertaking activities such as uh, needs assessments or looking at the evidence uh, uh, and what it says uh, so that we can better understand uh, the factors that influence the people's behaviors as well as the barriers and facilitators for their behaviors before we can plan and uh, implement interventions. So this way we are able to uh, uh, work around adequately equipping our healthcare workers uh, so that they can overcome the barriers that are likely to prevent uh, them from adopting the desired behaviors or practice practices. And that would result in more uh, long lasting and more impactful uh, uh, change interventions. So uh, from our experiences, both what uh, Alice and myself have shared with you, um, there are so many assumptions that you've always made uh, around uh, people's behaviors and uh, what uh, we need to do to change uh, people's behaviors. So uh, there is uh, this general assumption that uh, education changes people's behaviors. Uh, but this is not always true, Ed although education is uh, uh, a really important uh, behavior change function, uh, education does not necessarily change uh, behaviors and information alone is not enough. And I'll give you an example. Uh, think about a person who is, uh, or people who smoke, for instance, and uh, they, uh, they may know uh, that uh, smoking could damage their health, both in the, in the short and in the long term, but they will still smoke uh, anyway because the short term gain of the stimulating uh, effect uh, is uh, more meaningful to them than the long term risk that you're trying to uh, uh, relate to them. And you'll see even uh, information, uh, health information on uh, uh, cigarettes uh, saying that, that uh, smoking kills, but that does not stop people from, from smoking. They will still smoke uh, because uh, of other factors that are influencing uh, uh, their, uh, their behaviors. And the second myth is that you need to change attitudes to change behavior. Uh, though attitudes are really important in uh, uh, behavior change and sustaining behaviors, uh, they 
tend to follow behaviors. So usually people will change their behavior and the attitudes will uh, follow subsequently. So uh, it's always uh, more beneficial to focus on behavioral expectations uh, uh, where uh, they, you set expectations for, for, for uh, people or you help them to uh, set those expectations that if this is going to happen, then uh, this is going to be the effect of it. That way, there is likely the evidence shows that it's likely to have more uh, impact in terms of influencing their behavior than uh, trying to influence their attitudes so that they can change their behavior. And the final assumption that we always make is that uh, people uh, know what motivates them. And uh, while the actual truth is that uh, what motivates people is not always that straightforward. Uh, we, on many occasions, are influenced by social norms, and I have briefly explained about this. And uh, uh, I'll give another example. So recently, I uh, followed uh, groups of uh, healthcare workers uh, during war drums just to assess their hand hygiene practices. And what I observed was uh, really interesting, but uh, you will, uh, 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 it was quite interesting because uh, uh, I saw that those clinical teams where the lead consultants was performing hand hygiene as uh, required, there was more compliance with uh, the practice as opposed to the clinical teams where the lead consultant uh, did not perform uh, hand hygiene. So in this case, it was more to do with the actions of the lead consultants that influenced their juniors to um, adhere to uh, hand hygiene uh, practices or their behavior. So their motivation was that uh, seeing their uh, 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 lead consultant uh, who is leading their team performing that hand hygiene and it kind of influenced them. So it, it was not about uh, really um, uh, the, uh, 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 them knowing what motivates them to, to change their behaviors. So for many years, it's always been taught that uh, um, uh, behaviors or practices, uh, or changing uh, people's behaviors or practices is uh, simple. And although sometimes it is, uh, uh, sometimes it is not always the case. Uh, increasing uh, uh, knowledge uh, and changing attitudes can lead to behavior change, but this needs to be informed by the evidence and uh, in, implemented by the use of evidence-based interventions. A more useful approach would be considering the broader behavior change ecosystem and uh, working around it to influence people's behaviors. And we can do uh, triple the impact with the same effort. We only uh, have to think how we change uh, behavior and uh, how we are going to reach others to influence them to, to change their behaviors as well. So there are a couple of things that uh, are always important to consider if you want to uh, change people's behaviors. And um, this is uh, uh, knowing what needs to be changed and um, uh, how to change it. So, and now that, it, it would seem that if we know about the factors that uh, can influence behavior change, then it would be simple to implement behavior change by tackling these aspects. This can sometimes work, but sometimes we need to open uh, to the unexpected and also recognize the fact that uh, what works in one circumstance does not necessarily work in another. We need to have a clear understanding of um, uh, what needs to be changed and how to go about influencing people to uh, adopt the, the, the desired change. So, uh, sorry about that. So in terms of just going about uh, influencing uh, people's behavior, this is just um, uh, a as a, a process that we could follow to um, uh, help us to uh, have more impact in terms of if we are targeting to change the practices of healthcare workers or uh, other 
uh, people in the communities that we are working in. So the first step is always to try and understand what uh, needs to be changed. And uh, so you need to have a clear definition of what behavior needs to be uh, uh, changed and uh, uh, you, uh, uh, explore what are some of the factors that uh, limit uh, uh, people from engaging in that behavior. As I said, uh, preliminary interactions with the people that you are targeting to work with uh, could uh, really be useful in trying to help you to understand some of the barriers that uh, may prevent them from uh, 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 adopting the desired change. And there are different uh, types of barriers. Um, uh, there could be physical barriers, there could be psychological barriers, there could be social barriers that you need to, to look into uh, so that uh, uh, what, when you plan for your interventions, then you're able to uh, uh, work around these barriers and empower the uh, people you're working with more so that they can um, adopt the desired change. So secondly, after you have uh, kind of uh, defined the uh, issue that needs to be changed or the practice or the behavior that needs to be changed, then we need to identify interventions that we can use to, um, to uh, uh, change those uh, behaviors and uh, or those practices. And there are different interventions. I will shortly uh, just uh, talk about this. And uh, there are different interventions that we could uh, uh, implement as well as trying to look at uh, policy aspects uh, so that uh, you have a, a kind of uh, an enabling uh, environment uh, for people to adopt the desired change. Then lastly, you want to uh, look at uh, the relevant techniques that you could use to uh, change uh, people's behaviors and also just thinking about how you will go uh, uh, about uh, delivering uh, these behavior change techniques. So behavior change interventions are most effective when they are structured according to the models and theories of behavior change. And there are many uh, theories of behavior change. I think one review recently uh, identified more than 83 theories of behavior change. And uh, these uh, theories seem to be complex and sometimes lack coherence. Uh, and this makes the application uh, in interventions even uh, difficult. Although the theories identify some of the key determinants for behavior change, uh, lack of comprehensiveness uh, and sometimes coherence in some of the theories makes it difficult for intervention designers and uh, consequently uh, their uh, utility is limited. But behavior change as any science has continued to evolve over the past uh, few years and uh, new frameworks have been uh, proposed uh, that are much simpler to apply uh, if we are trying to uh, influence people's behaviors or practices. One of such uh, uh, frameworks is the behavior change will, which has been proposed uh, uh, by Susan Michi and her, co her colleagues. So the behavior change will is also referred to as the COMB model and it outlines three um, key ingredients, uh, namely uh, capability, opportunity and uh, motivation. So these uh, key uh, factors interact to uh, uh, produce uh, behavior. So capability uh, refers to uh, the person's uh, physical and psychological ability to engage in uh, a behavior. Uh, so they need to know what needs to be done and they need to have the skills of uh, uh, engaging in uh, that uh, behavior. Uh, opportunity looks at whether the environment is um, uh, favorable to make uh, a behavior possible or not. So this can be influenced by physical uh, issues uh, uh, such as time or money resources and uh, social environment such as the cultural and uh, social norms as I've uh, already explained. And uh, 
for instance, if you are trying to ensure that there are uh, people uh, engaged in hand hygiene practices, for instance, uh, so you need to make sure that there are hand hygiene facilities in place uh, that will, uh, so that the environment is uh, conducive for them to engage in that in, uh, uh, practice or uh, behavior that you want them to, to uh, adopt. Uh, motivation uh, looks at the drive uh, to do something and this uh, can be looked at in two different uh, perspectives. One, one is to look at the reflective processes, which include um, uh, people doing a cost-benefit analysis of uh, whether something is worthwhile doing. And uh, you also have the automatic processes, and this includes the emotional reactions, uh, wants and needs and habits relating to uh, uh, what uh, uh, they are doing. But again, we need to be conscious of the fact that people will have different behavior change needs. Uh, for example, uh, when you assess people's behaviors, you may realize that um, one person or a group of people lack capability, either in terms of their knowledge uh, or skills to engage uh, uh, in, in a desired behavior, while another group uh, may uh, need motivation more than uh, capability or uh, opportunity. So what I have seen from my own experience is that uh, we mostly tend to focus on capability more, and this is trying to equip uh, people or health, healthcare professionals with knowledge and skills uh, about practices and behaviors that we want them to adopt. Uh, uh, and we tend to pay less attention to opportunity and motivation, which may be the real problem why they are not engaging in the desired behavior uh, or practice. So uh, just something to be aware of uh, uh, when we are uh, trying to implement uh, 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 behavior change interventions in our health partnerships. So something else uh, that you may also need uh, to consider is that um, in order to deliver your behavior uh, change intervention, uh, there are many uh, techniques, uh, I think about 94 behavior change techniques that have been proposed um, uh, or that have been mapped uh, uh, through the theoretical domains uh, framework and behavior change uh, uh, technique taxonomy, also proposed by Susan Michi and uh, her colleagues. And uh, uh, these are uh, um, divided into 16 categories, and uh, these are useful in influencing uh, people's behaviors uh, so that they adopt the desired uh, practices. It is uh, also important uh, to note that um, all, not all behavior change uh, techniques have the same evidence of utility. You don't uh, have to use all of them. There is so many of them, 94. And uh, the most important thing is to uh, know that uh, uh, people will have different behavior change needs. Uh, so as I have already explained, you might need to influence they might have the capability already, or they might have some aspects of their capability that is missing. Uh, probably uh, they need you to focus more on motivation. So that will influence the kind of techniques that you are going to employ uh, when you engage with uh, 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 communities or with uh, healthcare professionals to try and um, uh, influence their behaviors. Uh, some of these uh, um, uh, behavior change uh, techniques involve, uh, like if you want to uh, motivate them, you could uh, use uh, persuasive arguments, uh, helping them to understand the pros and cons of their behavior, providing incentives, uh, like for, uh, for instance, I know uh, uh, like within the National Health Service, um, there is a program to um, promote good antimicrobial uh, prescribing. It's called the Local Enhancement Scheme. So what they do is that if uh, uh, primary care uh, prescribers achieve the uh, 
prescribing targets in terms of their uh, antibiotic prescriptions, then they are paid some money which they can channel back to their to their surgeries and uh, uh, develop their practices even even further. And that has managed to reduce um, uh, prescribing or, or, or has reduced inappropriate uh, prescribing by about 38% uh, in some uh, health boards. So if you are looking at uh, um, uh, 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 actions uh, towards regulation, so you, you might uh, implement uh, aspects such as uh, problem solving, uh, helping them to cope and plan, goal setting, uh, having some behavioral contracts, reviewing behavioral goals, providing feedback is really an important uh, uh, way of reinforcing uh, uh, behaviors of healthcare professionals. But most of the time we miss out on uh, opportunities to provide feedback and uh, how uh, to provide constructive uh, feedback that would reinforce people's behaviors. And then uh, we could also employ um, uh, aspects such as restructuring the physical environment, uh, distractions, uh, use of rewards and uh, punishment. Now punishment does not uh, in, uh, involve um, uh, like the uh, administering uh, a punishment. It could be withholding a reward, like if you are to give them something, then just don't give them because uh, they did not achieve the, the set targets. So that way uh, you have delivered a, a punishment uh, without uh, uh, going, uh, uh, administering any kind of physical uh, uh, intervention. So I would like to stop there and uh, so that I don't, talk so much about uh, people's behaviors and behavior change and uh, uh, not sure if there are any questions uh, that I could um, uh, answer. Now, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions and uh, any comments as well. Thank, Thank you, you Bernard, that's amazing. Could you stop sharing your screen maybe so we can um, see everybody? Um, great. So do um, put up your hands if you've got any questions or open your um, camera if you had any comments. So we, we don't want to put you off. So I think one of the big things I was uh, reflecting on there as Bernard was talking is how complex the situation is. And it's actually whether we're here in our UK situation or whether we're overseas um, working. And I think there can be in the a sort of automatic jumping to a conclusion sometimes and this essence of these tools and these frameworks which Bernard has shown us is such wonderful sort of reflection tools for maybe just sitting back and just taking a little bit longer um, to consider what the issues um, might be. I was quite love the fact you used the hand hygiene example, an um, emergency medicine consultant who was trying to instigate some work in Pakistan actually told me about an incident where ex many colleagues kept going back and doing hand washing audits and kept coming back with the same recommendations of more training or more hand washing needed being done. But of course, actually, it was access to water. Um, and if not the water, it was that actually nobody was re was nobody's job to actually restock the store cupboard with the alcohol gel to ensure that there was some always on the ward. And it didn't matter how many audits and how much training you gave without looking at that bigger system. You were never actually going to change, change, change the behavior. Um, but Bernard, I know when we spoke the other day, I haven't seen any hands go up at the moment. We also just talked about. Um, maybe I'm picking, I had a much more positive example. Um, I think yeah. I realised my negative was that I had the agency to get a nice big room in which to hold a class, but maybe the, the, the local individual didn't when we weren't there. Um, but a much more positive example of we um, have registrars that, that come on our camps with us and we, we go as a very active multidisciplinary um, team. And it was nothing that was necessarily in our log frame or in our um, sort of expected change but being the physio, obviously working with an orthopedic team and surgeons and scrub nurses and everybody and all part of the team meeting in the morning and part of the ward rounds is at the very end, somebody, one of the registrars who'd been with us the year before sort of said to me how he'd gone back to his hospital at the coast and had just decided he was never going to hold a ward round without the multidiscipline team around him of the ward nurse and a physio. Over. And it was nothing that we'd planned to change. But it was sort of what happened as that unintended consequence. And I think often we're often looking for such narrow 
changes and actually we've, we, it's that making sure we sort of capture some of the others but also um you know who is it who's going to make those extra changes yeah exactly uh alice that's uh, absolutely uh, right and i think um uh, when you look at uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, specifically the example that you have uh, shared, uh, it kind of uh, uh, relates back to what we we're just talking about. So sometimes um, when we want to change uh, people's practices and behaviors, we might be looking at uh, having uh, some kind of impact, but where we, we miss out on uh, those aspects of uh, where we could uh, uh, easily impact, um, impact uh, change. And that's why uh, these frameworks that help us to kind of just map uh, what needs to be changed and uh, how to go about effecting that change is, uh, is uh, useful. But I would also uh, like to talk about this from a different point of view uh, in terms of uh, how uh, change gets uh, uh, disseminated or how uh, uh, change is uh, uh, taken up by professionals uh, when we try to uh, influence their behaviors. Usually when you tend to uh, implement uh, change. So as uh, uh, also referring back to the example that I gave initially, we could go out, select a group of, uh, a core group of healthcare workers and uh, ask them to come for some training and then we want them to carry on with uh, uh, whatever uh, training or skills that we've been, uh, given them uh, to, uh, to transmit those to other healthcare workers. So, uh, but if you think about it, uh, we are all uh, different. Healthcare workers, everyone is unique and uh, people will, uh, 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 will take or will, uh, uh, will consider change uh, in different perspectives. So uh, it, we need to be conscious of how we can diffuse uh, change. Uh, 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 amongst our healthcare workers. So there is a theory called the diffusion of innovation um, uh, theory, which just kind of looks at those differences that we have, uh, uh, unique differences that we have amongst uh, ourselves, that uh, if there was a change uh, idea uh, that is presented to us today, and then, so there are those who will say, okay, this really sounds like a brilliant idea. I need to start working on, on to it. I need to see if it's going to work. I'm going to experiment. So we are, there are those who are willing to experiment with the idea and uh, take risks uh, with the idea and see if it's working. So these are usually uh, in the category of um, early adopters. And it's always important to try and uh, find these early adopters uh, when we uh, are looking at healthcare workers and if we are trying to um, impact uh, change interventions in those uh, healthcare settings. Uh, because what happens is uh, once you build a critical mass of early adopters, uh, because they, are, they will experiment with the idea, they will look at uh, the practicalities, the difficulties with that idea, and they might even come up with uh, more uh, uh, practical uh, approaches to making it work within their, their system. And once they have done that, then you've got another category of uh, people who will, uh, uh, they will listen to the idea and they will say, okay, this is um, a brilliant idea, but uh, has it worked elsewhere? Uh, so they will want to see the evidence that it's worked elsewhere uh, or in a place which has uh, a similar circumstance as their own so that because they're not uh, really willing to take on board that, that uh, risk uh, to start experimenting with ideas. They want something that is working and then once they see that, you give them the evidence, then they will uh, be willing to uh, implement that. And then you've got the, uh, uh, the late majority, uh, also uh, 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 a large proportion of us uh, are 
in the light majority. So we, after we've seen the ideas working, they've been tested and there are no issues coming out, then we say, okay, uh, it's, it's working. So uh, we're going to uh, implement this as well. But I've got those that um, will not uh, 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 consider these new ideas that you're trying to implement. Uh, you will discuss with them and they will uh, listen to you and uh, they will say, uh, they will appreciate you. And But at the end of the day, uh, unless you it, it's made, it's, uh, made a, matter, a matter of life and death, uh, they're not going to uh, uh, consider those changes. Uh, one example is uh, some of the continue, continuing uh, professional development courses, yeah? Uh, so previously, uh, it's to say, okay, um, you need this for your professional development. But there are those people who never uh, 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 undertook those courses. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, and until it was it was uh, made, uh, uh, like a policy was passed that you you need this for your accreditation. You won't get accredited if. Uh, you don't uh, complete your CPD courses, then it's, that's when you see uh, some other healthcare workers now taking on board the idea of uh, continued professional uh, development. So we always need to be conscious of uh, all these um, uh, dynamics within uh, the healthcare workers that we are uh, trying to influence to change their behaviors. The best strategy is to try and uh, target those people who are going to take our, the ideas on board uh, uh, immediately, build a critical mass, and uh, support them to influence the other healthcare workers so that they can uh, adopt the practices that you're trying to change. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, find your early adopters. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Um, does anybody have any have any questions? Charlotte's here. Any comments in the chat? Anybody got any examples they want to share? I know we've only got a few minutes left. No. A question, and then it might be time to wrap up. So um, I, I was actually wondering, so a new volunteer, somebody was just beginning to think about or was just about to head off um, on a volunteering overseas or work volunteer at work overseas opportunity, what do you think the key thing that they should remember um, when they approach change in a setting that's sort of unknown to them, that's that's new and not like the NHS in perhaps some ways, but is similar in other ways? Bernard, perhaps I'll come to you first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put you both on the You've spot. You've got two minutes, Bernard. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. I think the the key thing that they need to remember is uh, that uh, people are unique, and uh, they will have uh, different behavior change needs. And unless we know what their behavior change needs are, it may be difficult to influence them to change their their behaviors. So having that kind of understanding. Uh, 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 interacting with those healthcare workers is really useful or looking at evidence that uh, is talking about the practices that you want to change will be really useful in trying to help you to understand the aspects that you need to change and then you can now map your interventions, uh, identify the barriers that uh, need to be addressed and work around the techniques that uh, are applicable uh, and uh, they are uh, applicable to that setting. Uh, that's why I'll say, yeah, it's a lot to to think of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ben. And and your slides and presentation earlier, I think, gave us even more to think about. So yes, thank you. And thank uh, you. Alice, final. Yeah, thank, well, actually, I think my answer fits, follows on really nicely from Bernard. So one of the key things I've always said whenever I've gone overseas, whenever I've said anyone else to go overseas pause and actually enjoy a cup of tea and enjoy a cup of tea with the colleagues you're working with with the colleagues or the patients or whoever it is you're trying to sort of hopefully influence because obviously you've gone out there with a vision of hoping to affect change and to support a development of something but actually unless you stop and pause and listen and listen with this understanding of complexity in the back of your mind 
you'll probably launch straight in into slightly the wrong thing. And if you've just taken that time for an extra cup of tea, and the, also it's a great cup of tea, wonderful rapport, you can get to make some lovely friends. But actually, I think I think it could then give you that time to just spend that little bit of time reflecting on um, so many of the lessons and the ideas that Bernard Bernard said us today. It'll also help you find your early adopters, which are obviously the key people in the, in all of this. Brilliant, thank you. I think that's probably what we'll all go and do now. You made us all think of cups of tea. So we're off to make cups of tea and think about um, how we can change the world, Bernard. So thank you yeah, so yeah. much um, to you both uh, for joining us and thank you to everyone for uh, joining this afternoon's webinar. Um, some lovely comments coming in already, so glad that it's been interesting and useful. Um, please do uh, send any questions through to us. You can find um, our emails on the FET website or um, reply through Going Global and we can, we can follow up with any questions that you might have on any of the presentations and we'll share um, the recording and hopefully Bernard's brilliant slides as well if he lets us. We'll put those online and everyone can follow up with them afterwards. But um, all I have to say is please do join us next week for the final uh, webinar in the series which is going to be led by Professor Matt Harris who is leading us through um, the very important issue of unconscious bias and the need to look for innovation everywhere we go and not just in the UK. So it should be a really good final session of the series. Um, thank you everyone so much. Enjoy a cup of tea and your reflective moments after this. And I look forward to seeing everyone um, next week. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Great. Bye. Thanks Bernard. Thanks Charlotte. That's, um... I am off to have a good team. <laughs> yes, yes, me too. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so okay, much. Thank touch. you. Take That's care. Okay. Bye.